16th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Hey everyone, it's Matt here and this is One Minute for Mass. This weekend is Sunday number 16 in Ordinary Time and the Gospel features Mary and Martha. Martha's sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him and Mary notices that she's left to do all the serving by herself. But when she complains, Jesus points out that Martha's actually made the better choice. Now Jesus isn't advocating laziness in this encounter, but rather he wants to point out that there's a time and a place for everything, and that sometimes one good choice will outweigh another good choice. In particular, he wants to encourage Mary and Martha to make spending time with him a priority. We can get so caught up in our own busy lives, just like Mary, and we concentrate on serving the Lord, but we rarely stop to spend time with Jesus. If you can't remember the last time you just stopped, sat still and spent time with the Lord, then I know Jesus is saying the same thing to you today, to make the good choice and prioritize quality time with him. The invitation is there right in the scriptures and Jesus is waiting. So why not set aside some time, even right after this video, to just sit at the feet of the Lord and listen. I'll see you guys at Mass. Good day to you. You are watching The Word Exposed. Let us behold Jesus, the Word Incarnate, revealing Himself to us in the Sunday readings. It is the 16th Sunday in Ordinary Time, and in the Gospel, we are reminded of the Lord's visit to the house of the sisters Martha and Mary. Martha is burned with much serving. Mary, meantime, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, just like any disciple. The Lord tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better part, which is listening to God's Word. While ensuring that our visitors are taken care of and are having a grand time at our place, may we remember also that listening to them is a pleasing form of hospitality. Mary chooses to listen to Jesus, and by affirming Mary that Mary is doing the better part, Jesus is breaking social strictures. Anyone is welcome to sit at the feet of a rabbi and learn from him. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent while the day was growing hot. Looking up, Abraham saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them, and bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, If I may ask you this favor, please do not go on past your servant. Let some water be brought that you may bathe your feet and then rest yourselves under the tree. Now that you have come this close to your servant, let me bring you a little food that you may refresh yourselves, and afterward you may go on your way. The men replied, Very well, do as you have said. Abraham hastened into the tent and told Sarah, Quick, three measures of fine flour. Knead it and make rolls. He ran to the herd, picked out a tender, choice steer, and gave it to a servant who quickly prepared it. Then Abraham got some curds and milk, as well as the steer that had been prepared, and set these before the three men. And he waited on them under the tree, while they ate. They asked Abraham, Where is your wife Sarah? He replied, There in the tent. One of them said, 
I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will then have a son. The Word of the Lord Welcoming God We are used to welcoming people into our lives. We have a word for it, hospitality. But what happens when you welcome God? Is it possible for us to even welcome God, our Creator, someone greater than us and greater than everything? The first reading is from the book of Genesis. Abraham, on a very hot day, sitting at the entrance to his tent, sees three persons. Now, according to the reading, it is God who is visiting, who is passing by. Now, we do not know whether this is God accompanied by two angels. Later on, some Christian writers would say that this is some sort of an intimation of the three persons of the Trinity. We do not know, but the author of the book of Genesis says it is God. The three persons symbolize for Abraham what we call the person of God. And look at how Abraham welcomed these mysterious men. Maybe from our perspective, we would say, is Abraham not overdoing it? Is this not an example of overacting? <laughs> if you are looking at this like on a stage. Now, Abraham ran to the three persons. And he was not content in greeting them. He bowed before them as though the persons in front of him belonged to the royalty. Then he even begged them to come and to have water to bathe their feet with. And he begged them to stay so that he could prepare food for them. Imagine, he was not just saying, come, stay for a while. He was begging them. Look at the welcome that Abraham affords to them, renders to them, to them who are practically strangers to him. And the exuberance of Abraham's welcome of the Lord is in a way highlighted by the comportment, by the attitude, <laughs> by the response of the three mysterious persons. They just said, yes. Very briefly, curtly responding, okay, okay. So, you have here, wow, shining, almost uh, by contrast, the exuberance of Abraham's welcome of the three persons. And uh, he had the meal prepared for them. He had even a steer, you know, uh, butchered and, and uh, prepared you know, as a meal for them. And while they were eating, the three persons asked about Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And Abraham said, well, his, she's in the tent. Just like any regular woman of that time, she would be in the tent. It is not proper for her to do the entertaining. She is in the tent. And now came the word of one of them. I will come back at this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Abraham welcomed God and that welcome of God led to a promise, a word that needs to be welcomed. 
we know later on how they would react. Abraham would laugh. Sarah would laugh, almost in disbelief. But you need to welcome the word of the Lord, the promise of the Lord. Justice will live in the presence of the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. One who walks blamelessly and does justice who thinks the truth in his heart and slanders not with his tongue. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Who harms not his fellow man nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, by whom the reprobate is despised, while he honors those who fear the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Lends not his money at usury, and accepts no bribe against the innocent. One who does these things shall never be disturbed. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Psalm chapter 15 verses 2 through 5. A psalm of David, Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy mountain, whoever walks without blame, doing what is right, speaking truth from the heart, who does not slander a neighbor, does no harm to another, never defames a friend, who disdains the wicked, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath despite the cost, lends no money at interest, accepts no bribe against the innocent, whoever acts like this shall never be shaken. About the time of this writing David was returning the ark to Jerusalem that the Philistines had captured. This psalm tells about a ceremony in which an Israelite was admitted to the temple court. The temple was not like a church that one could enter at any time. It was God's house and it could be entered only at certain times and under certain conditions. A person had to be admitted by a priest. The visitor had to answer the questions of the priest at the gate, who may sojourn in your tent. Tent was a traditional reference to the temple in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem temple had replaced the tent of meeting in the desert. Without commitment to the covenant, without conversion, one cannot enter the presence of the Lord. The psalm shows that nearness to the Lord is not a matter of external ritual alone, it demands heartfelt commitment as well. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church, of which I am a minister in accordance with God's stewardship given to me to bring to completion for you the word of God, the mystery hidden from ages and from generations past. But now it has been manifested to his holy ones, 
to whom God chose to make known the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. It is Christ in you, the hope for glory. It is he whom we proclaim, admonishing everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The Word of the Lord. This is the experience of St. Paul. In the second reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians, St. Paul welcomes the sufferings that he must bear for the sake of the church. He welcomes suffering. Isn't this weird? Would anyone welcome suffering? We might say yes on certain conditions. And St. Paul says, I am willing, I welcome the sufferings what, which is lacking huh, in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of the church. So he has this vision of the church as intimately connected with Jesus. Jesus the head, the church as the body of Christ. And the suffering of the head, Jesus, continues in the sufferings of the body. And St. Paul is welcoming those sufferings to complete what Jesus did not suffer yet for the sake of his body. And if we are flabbergasted by such a hospitality to suffering, we look closely and we see that that is part of St. Paul's welcome of Jesus, welcome of the mission that he has received from Jesus. St. Paul was commissioned by Jesus to preach his word. St. Paul welcomed the word of Jesus, a word of commissioning, so that he could proclaim the word about Christ, our hope of glory. And for Christ, if you welcome Christ, you welcome a mission. You welcome even the sufferings that your mission entails for Christ and His body. Welcoming the Lord. Welcoming His Word. Welcoming His calling. Welcoming the sufferings that come with mission. Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, 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 Martha you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. 
Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord and his disciples were traveling along and came to a village. When they got there, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat down in front of the Lord and was listening to what he said. Martha was worried about all that had to be done. Finally, she went to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it bother you that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen what is best, and it will not be taken away from her. Welcoming God. Welcoming God who comes to us in Jesus. In the first reading, the second reading, we see how welcoming God involves welcoming His word of promise in the case of Abraham and Sarah and in the experience of St. Paul. Welcoming Jesus is also welcoming a mission and welcoming even the sufferings for the sake of Christ and His church, a suffering that is entailed by the mission. Some of you might be already thinking of, wow, the difficulty of welcoming God. You said, wow, (laughs) but wow, that is the most important thing to do, to welcome God into our lives. We are back to this journey of Jesus to Jerusalem, as recorded by St. Luke in his Gospel. Jesus is determined to journey to Jerusalem to face his destiny, to fulfill his mission. But in the journey, there was a bit of respite, a bit of rest, to visit friends. And we have a very human situation here. Jesus stops at the house of his friends, Martha and Mary the sisters of Lazarus. And the two sisters welcome Jesus. A friend. Maybe they also sense that there is something quite unique and special about their friend Jesus. So there is this maybe intuition that welcoming this friend is much more than just welcoming into their house an ordinary passerby. And Martha, her character spelled out in many passages in scriptures, Martha was busy with the demands of hospitality. We can interpret this in terms of maybe household work, especially preparing a meal. Mary, again, true to her personality, as depicted in the Bible, in the New Testament, sat at the foot of Jesus, listening to his words. You see this seeming contrast. Mary moving around, especially in the kitchen area, to prepare a meal for the honored guest. And Mary, seated there at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, absorbing his words. And this occasioned a complaint on the part of Martha. 
telling Jesus, you know, look at this, how unfair. <laughs> My sister Mary, you know, left me alone to do all of this household work. And Jesus said, well, leave Mary alone. She has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken away from her. The better part. Jesus presents Mary, seated at his feet. This is the posture of a disciple, the posture of a learner. And at that time, most, if not all, of the students of Rabbi were males. So Mary here is taking a posture that you do not see among women. But she's there, taking the position and even the bodily posture of a disciple, of a teacher. And she listened. She welcomed the words of the Master. Welcoming the words of the Master. This is the better portion. And that should not be missing. That should not be taken away from anyone. The hospitality that is due to the Word of God. This is the foundation of all other acts of hospitality. Jesus is reminding all of us, not just Martha, that fundamental in discipleship and mission is to welcome God's Word. Without God's Word at the foundation, how could we welcome, how could we welcome the strangers? How could we welcome mission? How could we welcome suffering like St. Paul? This is a reminder to us. Be hospitable. But first, be hospitable to the Word of God. This is the mark of a true disciple, especially in the Gospel of St. Luke. A true disciple listens to the Word of God and then puts it into action. That is the total hospitality and welcome. You welcome the Word of God and then put it into action. I am appealing to everyone. In our world today, there are so many people who are being rejected. We long to see again the experience of Abraham welcoming strangers, welcoming strangers profusely. But nowadays we see strangers, especially those in need, refugees, forced migrants, fleeing from persecution and poverty, being driven away, driven away not being allowed to set foot on dry land. We see many people because of their addictions, because of the problems that they face, because of their misbehaviors, they're not welcomed even by their own families. They're being sold, betrayed, and even put to death. Now how do we restore that welcome? Welcome first the Word of God. Like Mary, listen to Jesus. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. Listen to Jesus. Welcome the Word of Jesus and then put it into practice. When that happens, true hospitality will be recovered, will be experienced in our world. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it.
Some of you may know that uh, when I was much younger, I uh, grew up in, uh, in California, Southern California. And uh, the only relatives that we had in, was my, uh, my mother's sister, and her family lived there as well. And so our families would usually get together for the holidays, Christmas and Thanksgiving, and oftentimes we'd go over to my aunt's house for Thanksgiving. And I remember that very distinctly because she'd sort of hover over you while you were at dinner. You know, she was one of these women who was just wanted to be all, get everything right and put everything down, you know, make the, the meal very nice and everything else. Then the kid, the we kids would be sit, sat in one area of the table and she would be up. Rather than sitting down at the, at the dining room table, she'd be up hovering up over you, making certain you, well, you didn't take any peas. You get some more peas and you didn't get any corn, get some more corn, you know. And I and all of you, I look at this today, and I think, did she ever enjoy the meal? Because she was just too busy making certain everybody had had uh, their rightful share, and everybody was, you know, had enough on their ta- on their de- on their uh, on their plate. I remember one time, one Christmas, we had dinner at their, her house, and she was making the whipping up the mashed potatoes. And she whipped them up in an aluminum pan. They turned green. This green, and we all put, we all put that aside. We decided. I, I bring this up because today we hear the story of hospitality. And we hear it not only in the gospel of Martha and Mary, But we also hear it in the first reading, in the story of Abraham. Now, Abraham and his wife were childless for years, and we know he became the father of many. Uh, it It is figured that Sarah had her first child. Abraham was around 90. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good mileage. We won't, don't go there. Okay. <laughs> the uh, fact is, is that, you know, we hear the story. And of course, you know, in those days, you know, of a childless couple, they were always looked upon as, you know, what's wrong with you? What's God, what's God cursing you for? And so, of course, we hear the story today in, in, the, in the passage is that, that Abraham sees these three gentlemen come through, through where he lives and in his tent and in his, in his area and he recognizes them to be God, God's presence. I, ironically, it's three men. Very interesting. But in those three, he comes over and he welcomes them. He washes their feet. He does all the traditional things that uh, in the Jewish understanding of, of welcoming. And he's so kind to them that he even, even offers them water. And then he gets his poor wife, says, go, go, go make some, some biscuits and we'll slaughter the calf and everything else, and he feeds them dinner. And then the understanding of welcoming be, brings about the understanding of God's presence even more. Who knows if these men were, were the presence of God, only that we see it in the, in the passage of Scripture. But it is through that gift of giving that they are enlightened. They are brought to, the presence of Christ is brought, God is brought to, to, to mind. And the gift that they looked for for so long comes to pass. And he says, from your generosity a year from now, your wife will be with child. I don't know if that was a good thing or bad at 90, but anyway. But the fact is, is that we see that understanding in the gospel passage, we see that uh, the importance of hospitality. But in the gospel passage, you know, uh, this gospel passage, by the way, is, uh, has been for years. Scholars have been at each other's throats about this gospel passage. Some say that it was an understanding, and for, tr- uh, for centuries it's been down, the understanding the difference between contemplative life and the life of missionary work and care. 
because Martha and Mary take different stands. Which one is better? You know, this is, these are religious. They're, they're always, uh, we're doing the right thing and you aren't type of deal. But the fact is, is there was this constant conflict in, within this, in this passage. But it really has nothing to do with what, one or the other. It has to do with the presence of God uh, in our life and what that means to us. Now, I want to, you have to, I'm, I'm really preponderant of a one who, who looks at the passage of Scripture and where it is in the, in, in, the, uh, in the gospel. This gospel follows exactly, this passage follows exactly what we had last week. And you all know that that passage was? The Good Samaritan. I told you earlier, I know. But anyway, the, the, the Good Samaritan. And in the Good Samaritan, we hear about the idea of giving. We have the idea of being kind and generous. And so what does, you know, Martha do? Jesus comes to her home, and she is kind and generous. She's picking up the, flu, the food, and that's what women were supposed to do. I mean, especially if, God, if Christ comes to their, their home, and they, they show acceptance and love and appreciation, what do they do? They, they serve them. We hear that when, when Jesus comes and to Peter's house and, and heals his mother-in-law, what does she immediately do? She gets up and serves them, right? Boy, that's, that's, the message is, is, is quite clear in, the, in that understanding of the tradition. And so we see that Martha is there, and most likely Jesus is not there by himself. There's, there's a, you know, quite, quite a... There's a controversy about that as well. But the, most likely, is he's, there, he's there with his, his disciples. And there, there may be other uh, apostles following uh, that, are, that are there. Uh, you know, there may be a whole group of people there. And it is very unusual that one of the women would be there with the men, listening to him preach in her home, or outside, around the, wherever they were. But Martha, Mary is there just with uh, intent and looking upon the Lord and listening to him, making him feel at home in the sense that she's accepting the word, understanding the word. And so in that, he, we hear that a complete understanding of how the difference between Martha is always there serving, which we are called to do, but also Mary is there listening to God. Now, when Martha comes in, and I love this good old Martha, because I'm probably a little bit more Martha than I am Mary. Don't ever hand that again, back to me anyway. Though. <laughs> but the fact is, is that when Martha is doing all this stuff and she starts to get irritated, that I need some help up here. I'm doing all this stuff and I, all these men are here and I'm, you know... I need another hand to help me. So she goes out to the Lord and says, Lord, Master, get Mary in here. Doesn't that sound familiar? You know, doesn't that sound... I'm so busy with trying to serve you all. I'll get Mary in here. And then, you know, you hear almost this harsh tone. Some people will take it as a harsh tone where, where Jesus turns to Martha and says, Oh, Martha, Martha, you're overly concerned about all this. Stuff. You're hovering over me at the dining room table. You're hovering over us about this. Yeah, we're hungry. Yes, we, we, we appreciate the meal. But Mary is here getting the basics. Why are you doing this? You know, the whole, the whole emphasis of this passage is in relationship to the, the, the book or the story of the Good Samaritan in the sense that the Good Samaritan, if you just left the Good Samaritan as it is, we'd be all out doing, doing helping the poor and doing all constantly. But this tones the understanding of the Good Samaritan down because this story turns right, follows right after and says... Yes, it's extremely good to meet the needs of others. But you have to put it into perspective. You have to make certain why you're doing it, where it's coming from, 
What part, where is your, is your relationship with God in, rela- in your relationship of giving to the needs of others? And Mary has chosen the better. That's, you know, it's the primary reason that we give. You know, you see these, these actors and actresses, oh, they're helping, you know, we, all of a sudden, you know, we have some, some problem that happens in the world, whether it be Haiti or starving children in Africa and, uh, or some earthquake somewhere else or some disaster, and all of a sudden we see these stars who have apparently no religion, no relationship to, to you know, to any beliefs other than they're wealthy, and they're adopting kids and opening up, up. And then you think, how wonderful these people are. Why are they doing it? Why? Because the most important part of our relationship to give to others should be centered on our relationship with God. Our relationship with Christ. Without it, we're good humanitarians. But we're not, we're missing the the importance of our relationship with Christ, who we are and why we do it. Oh, I think it's wonderful that, you know, Madonna has adopted 20 kids or whatever, how many kids she's adopted. And and all, you know, all of these, Mary, uh, Jolie or whatever her name is. Yeah, you know her. She, you know, has adopted all these children from all over the world and they're, and they're a part of her family and, you know, good for them. And that, you know, some of them, and Oprah has opened up schools in Africa, you know. Good for them. But the most important part, the better of choice that we make, is why we do it. It doesn't say, that doesn't say that it's bad that they've done these things. It doesn't say that it's bad that when, when we aren't even thinking about it, we do something good for the needs of another. But the better part And this is the important part of this passage. Mary has chosen the better part. She has put it into perspective where Christ is in our life, where God is in our life. And so that is an important part of the puzzle that's put together when we realize the gift of giving. This is a homily for the 16th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Let's begin by looking once more at how St. Luke has structured his Gospel. The Gospel of St. Luke begins with the infancy narrative followed by the prelude to Jesus' public ministry. Luke then tells us of the Galilean ministry. Jesus then begins the journey to Jerusalem, and that journey takes us from chapter 9 to chapter 19. Today's Gospel comes from chapter 10, so we're on the road with Jesus. Jesus is making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. So he's travelling from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. Now travelling from north to south, we'd be inclined to say, I'm going down to Jerusalem. But Jewish people always spoke of going up to Jerusalem. And of course, geographically, they're quite correct. Capernaum, where Jesus lived, is about 208 metres below sea level. Jerusalem is almost 780 metres above sea level. So walking from Capernaum to Jerusalem, a distance of approximately 137 kilometres, you ascend almost one kilometre. So, as we heard in chapter 9, Jesus resolutely took the road for Jerusalem. 
But this is not just about a geographical journey from the north to the south. It's also another journey. It is the way of discipleship. And last week, and again this week, Jesus teaches us an important lesson about discipleship. These are lessons that break through traditional barriers. Incidentally, last week's Gospel, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and today's story about Jesus visiting the home of Martha and Mary are found only in Luke's Gospel. Last week's Gospel about the Good Samaritan taught us that our neighbour is not only someone from my own ethnic or cultural background. In other words, someone just like me. Think beyond those traditional barriers. The true neighbour is the one who is hospitable and compassionate, someone like the despised Samaritan. And in today's Gospel, another traditional barrier crumbles. But living in the 21st century in a Western culture, perhaps this barrier isn't all that obvious to us. Once again, we need to remind ourselves there is no text without context. And we need to remind ourselves that we're a 21st century audience and we're reading the work of a 1st century writer. We certainly need to have his 1st century Greek translated for us into English, but we also need a translation of the culture. The English biblical scholar Tom Wright reminds us of the importance of the cultural background when we're trying to understand ancient texts. He writes, No one should doubt the great value of social anthropology as part of the equipment of the historian. It's a way of recognising that different societies operate with different world views and social norms. So, how is that relevant to today's Gospel story? Wright explains that in the culture of the first century Palestine, and this is something that's still true in many parts of the world today, houses were divided into male space and female space, and male and female roles were strictly demarcated as well. So, male and female spaces within the house, as well as male and female roles. The kitchen and other quarters unseen by outsiders belonged to the women. The public room was the place where the men would meet. Now that may sound outrageous to us in a Western culture, but it's still true in many Middle Eastern cultures today. Now notice that Mary sits at the Lord's feet and she listens to him speaking. Tom Wright explains what's happening here. Mary has crossed an invisible but very important boundary within the house. For a woman to settle down comfortably among the men was bordering on the scandalous. Who did she think she was? Only a shameless woman would behave in such a way. According to folklore, when we die, we're met at the gates of heaven by St. Peter. And what happens next may be something like this. Uh, just a small formality before I let you in. You must sit a short test. Just one question. Spell God. Oh, the man replies, God. Uh, G-O-D. Excellent says St. Peter. Please go right in. And again, Look, just a small formality before I let you in. You must sit a short test. Just one question. Spell holy. Holy. H-O-L-Y. Correct. Please go straight in. And then a middle-aged woman appears before St. Peter. She says, Thank God I'm dead. During my entire life, I've tried to excel in a male-dominated world, but time after time, 
I found myself bumping into the proverbial glass ceiling. I can't tell you how glad I am, finally, to see the end of male chauvinism. Ho! Oh, there's none of that here. Uh, now, before I let you in, you have to complete a short test. Spell onomatopoeia. The ancient rabbis could not conceive of a woman teaching the Torah. In the Talmud, which is a collection of rabbinic commentary on Jewish law, we read, It is better to burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. So back to the house of Martha and Mary. Mary has crossed an invisible but very important boundary within the house, and another equally important boundary within the social world. I'll allow the American biblical scholar Craig Keener to explain the significance of what has just happened. He writes, People normally sat on chairs or, at banquets, reclined on couches, but disciples sat at the feet of their teachers. Serious disciples were preparing to be teachers, a role not permitted to women. Mary's posture and eagerness to absorb Jesus' teaching at the expense of a more traditional womanly role would have shocked most Jewish men. It would seem that Martha is also put out and seeks to get her sister back where she belongs, in the kitchen. Lord, do you not care that my sister is leaving me to do the serving all by myself? Please tell her to help me. But Jesus is quite happy for Mary to stay where she is, sitting at his feet as a disciple. It's important to do what Mary is doing listening to the word, but it's also important to put the word into practice through service, which is what Martha is doing. So it's not what Martha is doing that's the problem, it's the way that she's doing it. Jesus replies, Martha, Martha, you worry and fret about so many things. Martha is worried. The word in the Greek text is marimnas. It could also be translated as anxious. Now, to get a feel for what St. Luke is telling us here, let me take you back to chapter 8 of the Gospel. There Jesus is teaching the people about the different ways in which people receive the word of God. He likens God's word to a grain of wheat being sown. Some of the seed falls on the path and the birds come and eat it up. Some of the seed falls on rocky soil. It germinates, but because there's little soil and no moisture, they quickly wither. But some seeds fall among thorns, and the thorns quickly choke them. These are people, Jesus explains, who hear God's word, but they're soon choked by the cares of life. Now here we have the same Greek word used here as a noun. Merimnon. It describes the cares or anxieties that can overwhelm us. Now this gives us a clue to what's taken hold of Martha. Sister Diane Bergant, an American biblical scholar, points out that in their own ways, both sisters are faithful disciples of Jesus, one listening to his word and the other performing service. But notice that Jesus tells us that Mary has chosen the better part. It is not to be taken from her. So Diane Bergant asks, what exactly is the better part that Mary chose? And she offers this suggestion. Might the answer be as simple as this? Is true hospitality found 
in giving personal attention to the guest rather than in being distracted from that person by the duties associated with hospitality. Father William Bausch tells us that he's been to Martha's house. She has welcomed me with great enthusiasm and has put out the best china and linen and great desserts, and every time I look, my coffee cup is miraculously refilled. And she pops up and down to check the stove, the refrigerator, the microwave, talks while moving about until I've had it, and finally exclaim, for crying out loud, will you just sit down and talk with me? Eugene O'Kelly was the chairman and chief executive of KPMG, one of America's big four accounting firms. In May of 2005, he was diagnosed with late-stage brain cancer and had only three months to live. He writes of those final few months of life in a book he wrote entitled Chasing Daylight, subtitled How My Forthcoming Death Transformed My Life. He lived a frantic life in his own words, my calendar was perpetually extended out over the next 18 months. I was always moving at 100 miles an hour. I worked all the time. I worked weekends. I worked late into many nights. I missed virtually every school function for my younger daughter. My annual travel schedule averaged conservatively 150,000 miles. For the first 10 years of my marriage, when I was climbing the ladder at KPMG, Corinne, my wife and I, rarely went on vacation. After that, vacations were mostly rolled out into the corporate outings I was required to attend. After his diagnosis, he finally slowed down, and then he writes, I discovered depths to which a business person rarely goes and learned how worthwhile it was to visit there, and sooner rather than later. You can call that I went through a spiritual journey, a journey of the soul, a journey that allowed me to experience what was there all along, but had been hidden thanks to the distractions of the world. He had the Martha syndrome, choked by thorns, the anxieties, concerns and worries of the world. This is an important theme in Luke's Gospel. Mary, the sister of Martha, has chosen the better part because she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him speaking. That is true hospitality. His word found a home in her heart. And earlier in the Gospel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, listens to all that the shepherds had been told about her newly born child. And, we're told, she treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Here we have an essential ingredient of discipleship. God comes first. As Christians we have many responsibilities. We are parents, spouses, or maybe children in a family. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his own family, he has disowned the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Again, in Colossians 3.18-20 we read, Wives be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. We are employees or maybe employers. Colossians chapter 3 verses 22 to 25 and 4 verse 1. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything, not only when being watched, as currying favor, but in simplicity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, work heartily, as serving the Lord and not men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, 
and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. When we fail to correctly prioritize our activities, we allow ourselves to become distracted by what is good in this world but at the same time we often miss out on what is better. Martha, our hostess today, distracted with day-to-day -day activities while Mary recognized what was better, spending time with the Lord. Both Martha and Mary had seen Jesus resurrect their brother Lazarus, certainly Jesus was the most important guest they ever had in their home. Martha was the one that extended the invitation to Jesus. It was Martha's house thus she wanted to show her hospitality and caring for her guests. Martha was trying to do what Isaiah taught 58 verse 7, share your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own. Sometimes our humanity our interest in this world causes us to overlook what is important. Imagine inviting the Son of Man, the Messiah to your home, what an honor to have him accept the invitation. When Jesus came to Martha's home, we can reasonably assume that he didn't come alone, his disciples and many others were following him. Martha would naturally assume that her younger sister would help her with the cooking and serving of their guests. She was wrong. Mary was devoting her attention to Jesus not to the kitchen. This made Martha anxious, distressed and she felt her sister was uncaring. Stepping into Mary's sandals we discover. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Sitting at his feet was the ancient posture of a disciple, she wanted to learn from him. She was more concerned about being a good disciple, than a good hostess. Are we allowing ourselves to become distracted by things of the world? Have we substituted God's position in our lives for a car, a house, or a job? Have we substituted God's position in our lives for our duties as husbands, wives, fathers, mothers? Have we substituted God's position in our lives for our responsibilities to work and community? If we place God first, we will find ourselves like Mary free of anxiety and filled with joy. Just like Mary we need to place God first and then we will become better hosts, spouses, parents, and workers. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Have you ever prepared and hosted a dinner party and you were so busy with the preparations that you almost didn't visit with your guests? Well, this is almost what happened to Martha in the Gospel for the Mass this weekend. Martha was so busy preparing the scenery for Jesus and the disciples who came to her house that she lost sight of the focus that it was actually Jesus visiting her house. And she got frustrated with her sister Mary, who was simply sitting at his feet listening to him instead of helping her with all of this work. And so she felt very comfortable with Jesus, and Martha said to him, and complaining about her sister, you know, that she's not helping me. And Jesus kindly pointed out to her, Martha, you're anxious about many things. And so these two people in our gospel point out to us two parts of our life. Mary representing our contemplative life, our life of prayer and union with God, and then Martha who represents the apostolic life. And so we need to find a unity in living a deep life of prayer and having a zealous apostolic life. And so there's a million ways that we can do this in our life, to bring Christ into our everyday activities. And this is truly where our holiness is found. And so whether it's simply starting our day with a morning offering, or making the sign of the cross before we get in the car, or just pausing sometime in the afternoon for a moment of prayer and union with the Lord, if we can find ways to bring Jesus into our everyday life. He will reveal his presence because he's truly present in our day-to-day -day activities. And truly, this is where we find our holiness. 
So as we go forward this week, let us find ways to grow in a life of prayer, which will fuel our apostolic life that will grow in love of God in our day-to-day -day activities. And our activities, again, will continue to support and fuel our life of prayer. God bless you. The Stranger and the Message A few years ago, on a late spring day a soft wind, like the softness of a baby's sigh, was blowing through the trees in the park. I went there not expecting anything more than just a few moments of solitude. Oh, there were a few people there doing various things and the usual scurrying of the resident squirrels, but overall, it was fairly quiet. I had spent all morning at work and for some reason, I'm not certain of, I decided to take the afternoon off to go to the park. As I sat there at the picnic table, I watched two squirrels playing on a nearby tree. I wondered what it would be like to live such a seemingly, carefree life as they. Those two squirrels appeared to belong together, a bond was there, they belonged with each other. Oh, how I wished I had that sense of belonging in my life. As a child, and into adulthood, I didn't feel like I was where I was supposed to be. The parent-child bond was there for me, but, I had always felt like there was something missing in my life. I took a deep breath, slowly exhaling, and watched the two squirrels run off to play elsewhere. I was so immersed in my thoughts I didn't hear my visitor approach the table. Excuse me miss, could I sit here with you, asked the elderly man, his voice barely above a whisper. Oddly, I had no problem granting his request. I smiled and motioned for him to be seated. He sat across from me, his hands clasped in front of him, resting on the table, he had such a calm expression on his face. I saw a familiarity in that old man's eyes but I couldn't place him, and was certain I had never seen or met him before. Across from me sat a stranger, but not a stranger, or so it seemed. He broke the silence by saying to me, we all belong even when we don't feel like we do. We all have a place to go. I was taken back by his words and said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you are trying to say. Even as a child, you felt that way. He replied. I was stunned and could not speak, but still felt no apprehension due to his words or his presence. He extended his hand, so warm and soft, and gently laid it upon my clasped hands. He squeezed my hands with that hand and said, he wants you to come home. And with that, he slowly rose to his feet and left. I sat there for hours, stunned. I thought about what he had said the rest of the day, and for days thereafter, but eventually I filed his words away. I never truly listened to the words of that stranger, at least, not until the day of my father's funeral four years later. Daddy was raised Catholic, as were my siblings, and I was baptized Catholic as a newborn. It seemed only natural to have a priest at his funeral. As I sat before daddy's coffin, I saw the priest, but, did not hear his voice or words spoken. Although the priest and the stranger in the park were not the same man, I heard that whisper of a voice of the stranger and remembered his calm expression and the gentleness in his eyes. Those words spoken to me four years prior I heard once again. This time I listened to the words, to the message, that stranger delivered to me that day in the park. He wants you to come home. About a month or so after daddy's funeral, I inquired and signed up for the RCIA program at the parish where I was baptized as a newborn. I made it to the place where I belonged, God's loving embrace. I realized there's a difference between hearing and listening, finally. I listened to the message from the stranger, and now. I'm home. In Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42 we read the story of Jesus' visit to Mary and Martha's home for a meal. The two sisters had conflicting approaches to the visit. Martha was anxious and untrusting. Mary was thoughtfully listening and learning as Jesus spoke to her. Martha failed to recognize that a meal is temporary but time with Jesus and scripture is a gift that lasts forever. We live in a Martha world, we're troubled, we're anxious, and we're distracted. We should pray and worship like Mary. 
Praying and listening to God is an important part of our life. Praying regularly will allow us to listen and sharpen our world, our community, and our family view. Like Mary we will be able to focus on important moments while at the same time seeking his advice.